Okay, hello everybody. Let's go ahead and talk about bacteria and viruses at the beginning of our immunology unit. All right, so first of all, bacteria are the oldest form of life on this planet. Um, the technical name for bacteria are prokaryotes. It means before nucleus. So they evolved on this planet about three and a half billion years ago, and they're much, much much simpler cells than the cells that we're made of. Um, and so they're called prokaryotes because it means before nucleus. They evolved on this planet before there was such a thing as a nucleus inside of a cell. Okay, so if they appeared three and a half billion years ago, how old is the Earth? Well, the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. So scientists are saying that um, this planet had no life on it whatsoever for the first billion years. And then around three and a half billion years ago is when the first prokaryotes showed up, the first bacteria, the very, very simplest life forms. Over time, we see the evolution of more and more complex cells. Um, what's interesting, well, there's many things that are interesting, but one thing that's interesting is that scientists actually believe that mitochondria and chloroplasts started out as bacteria that were self-sufficient, and then they ended up moving into larger cells and then just permanently living in larger cells. So we have mitochondria that do that make all of our energy, our ATP, and they're in our cells, and we think that those were actually self-sufficient bacteria at one time that are now part of our bodies. And remember, chloroplasts are what make plants green, and they're the things that photosynthesize and make our oxygen and glucose. Um, again, they think that those were bacteria that moved into cells and became part of the cells permanently. All right, there are so many more bacteria on this planet than there are anything else that you can think of that's living. In fact, in my body, I have a hundred trillion, so do you, a hundred trillion cells. I have more bacterial cells in my intestines than I have human cells in my body. So there's more than a hundred trillion cells, a hundred trillion bacterial cells in my intestines alone. So scientists have divided bacteria into two what they call domains. You might want to think of them as like kingdoms, they're classifications, and they're very, very different from one another. The first category is called the archaebacteria. Um, archae means ancient. Um, so these are the bacteria that evolved first on this planet, um, and they tend to live in extreme environments. And so how do we define extreme? Well, the extreme halophiles, they live in super, super salty environments. So remember that um, if we drink too much salt, we get really thirsty, um, and that's because salt causes us to become dehydrated. Well, these bacteria, they're able to live in salty environments or the thermoacidophiles, um, they're able to live in crazy hot environments um, that no other living thing on this planet can survive. Um, so these are called the archaebacteria, and they live in these extreme environments. That's all we're going to talk about the archaebacteria because they're not really relevant to us. They don't ever come in contact with us. They don't make us sick. What we're going to talk about in this unit are the U bacteria. And so you might want to think of you. These are the bacteria that affect you. Um, sometimes people kind of call them germs, but of course, germs would be bacteria and viruses. And maybe some people would even consider parasites to be germs. Um, but if we're talking about bacteria, the U bacteria are the germs. What's interesting to know is that less than 1% of bacteria actually make us sick. The vast majority of bacteria don't care about us. They have no impact on us whatsoever, or they actually help us. So some of them, like I mentioned, there's all these bacteria living in my intestines. Some of them are helping me digest my breakfast right now. Some of them make vitamins for us in our bodies so that we can um, live healthy. Um, some of them fight off disease-causing bacteria, and that's a funny way. Um, they basically just take up space. So you can have these um, bacteria that don't make you sick and they reproduce and they reproduce and they reproduce and you have lots of them. And then there's no space for bad bacteria to get in. And so they protect us from bad bacteria just by taking up space. Um, thank you, harmless bacteria. Um, and some bacteria are even used in making foods like yogurt and cheese. Some of you are aware of that already. So bacteria are not our enemy. Um, and we take medicines sometimes to kill bacteria. And sometimes that can actually um, have a bad impact on us. 
All right, so let's talk just about how um, the U bacteria look. So they're made of cells, that, um, that little rod shaped thing, that's a cell. It's only the size of a mitochondria. And just to give you a sense of size, you could have in any one of your cells, in any one of your cells, you might have hundreds or even thousands of mitochondria. So that gives you a sense of how itty bitty small this little bacteria is. Um, because they're made of cells, we consider them alive. They have DNA, that's that squiggly noodles in the middle, um, but they don't have a nucleus. That's why they're called prokaryotes, before nucleus. Um, they don't have any of the other organelles that we think of. They don't have Golgi or mitochondria or chloroplasts. They are some of those things. Um, so they're very, very simple and very, very small. Okay, just a quick quiz on yourself. What percent of bacteria make humans sick? Ding, 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 ding. 1%. Um, and then where do archaea bacteria live? If you were just going to say it very generally, you could say extreme environments. All right. Um, how do bacteria reproduce? Well, they reproduce through something that's called binary fission. So keep in mind that animals, they reproduce with sex and then the female either lays eggs or gets pregnant and then they have babies. Bacteria, they're much more efficient. They can reproduce as fast as every 20 minutes um, and they basically just clone themselves. So they split in half and they make two. So if I could just split myself in half and then there were two of me sitting here, that would be an example of binary fission. Um, the only way that they would change, there's a few ways actually, but one way that they could um, produce a clone that's not exactly the same is when they copy the DNA in the first cell. We're going to learn about this. When they copy the DNA in the first cell, maybe there's a mistake. That's called a mutation. And so by the time the, the cell splits into two, one of them is a little bit different because it inherited a mutation. Um, but otherwise, they're clones. So binary fission. So how is it that bacteria make us sick? Well, they make us sick very, very differently than the way viruses make us sick. Bacteria release toxins. Um, they reproduce super, super quickly. They crowd out our healthy tissues and they often will disrupt the normal functioning of our cells. And so bacteria make us sick in a very different way than viruses do. We're gonna learn that viruses are like um, little bombs going off and they, they blow up our cells. Um, so not at all similar. Just really quickly, um, you don't need to know this specifically, but what are things that are caused by bacteria that you may have heard of? So tuberculosis is arguably the most um, common infection on the planet. Um, maybe COVID is um, higher than it is right now, but um, something like one in four adults around the planet has tuberculosis they are not necessarily sick with it. So just like with COVID, we know that there are people who don't get symptoms, but they can pass it on. Same thing with tuberculosis. Um, lots and lots and lots of people have it. Something like five to 10% of them will actually develop symptoms and some of those will die from it. Um, strep throat, how many of you have had strep throat or have heard of it? That's caused by bacteria tetanus, cholera, um, chlamydia. It's a sexually transmitted disease that's caused by a bacteria. Um, and even some types of pneumonia, that's a lung disease or meningitis, which is a disease of the brain. Um, those can be caused by um, bacteria as well. All right, so how do we fight bacteria? Well, we have these amazing medicines that are called antibiotics and they interfere with how bacteria work. And antibiotics only, only, only work on bacteria. They don't do us any good for viruses. So with COVID, antibiotics are worthless. Um, so how do they work? Well, just to give you an example, um, bacteria have cell walls and our cells don't. Our cells are squishy. Um, they don't have a cell wall in them. So some antibiotics, they interfere with the formation of the cell wall. Well, that doesn't interfere with my cells because my cells don't have any cell walls. It just interferes with the bacteria. That's brilliant. So it interferes with the bacteria without harming me. Um, one disadvantage that we're going to learn about, though, is that remember some of those bacteria, like in my intestines, they're helping me digest my food and they're helping me make vitamins. Those are good bacteria. And if I'm swallowing antibiotics, I can actually get rid of some of my good bacteria. And that can have a, a second effect that can actually make me less healthy. Um, so antibiotics are very serious medications that we need to take under a doctor's um, instructions. Oh, and I forgot to show you this really cool photo. What is this a picture of? So these are called Petri dishes. And Petri dishes are little 
plastic or glass dishes that um, scientists put food in. It's called auger. And then they grow bacteria on them. And so in these four diagrams, we've got four different types, or not diagrams, photos. We've got four different types of bacteria growing. Basically, they took a Q-tip and dunked it in a bacterial substance of whatever, something, and then they smeared it. You can see the smear lines. They smeared it all over the Petri dish. But then there's these little discs all over. Those discs are antibiotic discs. So those are discs that have been dunked in an antibiotic. And then we put it on the Petri dish with the bacteria and the antibiotics kill the bacteria in that area. So what you're looking at, are those are called zones of inhibition. If there's a clear ring around one of the discs, that means it killed all of the bacteria in that area. But if there's no clear ring, like look at this one, there's no clear ring around that at all, that means it didn't kill any of the bacteria. So those bacteria, we say those bacteria are resistant to that antibiotic. Whereas this one did kill some bacteria. And if we look at the different discs, this one killed some bacteria. This one didn't kill any. This one killed quite a lot. And this one probably killed the most. It has the largest zone of inhibition. It killed the most bacteria. So here's a question for you. Which antibiotic, assume that this um, Petri dish is covered in a white bacteria, and any time that you see like a gray circle, that's a zone of inhibition where the bacteria have been killed. And look at the letters on each of the discs. That tells us the names of the different antibiotics. So for example, this one is ampicillin. And this one is, I'm forgetting all of a sudden. I can't remember the names of the antibiotics. Anyway, but I know this one's ampicillin. So which one would you prescribe if you were the doctor? If your patient had this white bacteria, they were sick with this white bacteria, which one would kill the patient's bacteria the best? And the answer is the one with the largest zone of inhibition. This is a test question, folks. Um, so you would... You would um, prescribe the IPM antibiotic because it killed a lot of bacteria. But ampicillin, these bacteria are completely resistant to. So you would never prescribe the ampicillin for this particular um, infection because these bacteria are resistant. They don't get killed by the ampicillin. All right, so what is antibiotic resistance and where does it come from? So when we use an antibiotic, so let's say I have a bacterial infection and I start taking antibiotics. My antibiotics are gonna kill all of the bacteria that are susceptible or weak. Um, but there might be, a, there might be, not always, there might be some strong mutant bacteria that for whatever reason, they don't get killed by the antibiotic. Now, under normal circumstances, that's okay. If I just have a few of those bacteria in my body that don't get killed by the antibiotic, my immune system can gobble those up and no problem. They, they can take care of it and I get better. The problem becomes some people have really weak immune systems or some people don't take their antibiotics correctly. And so that strong bacteria that survived, it starts reproducing and reproducing. And remember, they can clone themselves every 20 minutes. So that's exponential growth. And within 24 hours, you can have bazillions of these strong bacteria that no longer respond to the antibiotic. Um, and so now if a person gets sick a second time, then they need a new antibiotic because the old antibiotic's not going to work. And if that happens repeatedly, um, then we say that the, the bacteria is multi-drug resistant. That means that there are many antibiotics that these guys have evolved a, a resistance to. Um, and there's actually some bacteria on the planet now that are resistant to all known antibiotics. Um, and so there's nothing we can do if somebody comes down with an infection with one of these multi, 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 multi drug resistant or, um, bacteria. Okay, um, so just the, at the bottom it says, when someone has a weak immune system, those strong bacteria that were left behind begin to reproduce and we develop what's called antibiotic resistance. So there are two main things that they want the average person to do um, to prevent antibiotic resistance within our communities. Number one, um, make sure that you only take antibiotics when you have a bacterial infection. Most colds, including COVID, are not caused by bacteria. Most of the time when we feel sick, it's not bacteria, it's usually 
viruses. Um, so don't take antibiotics when you have a cold. You only take an antibiotic if your doctor has confirmed that you have a bacterial infection. And then the other thing is to make sure you completely finish your antibiotic prescription. I had a bacterial infection when my daughter was first born and they gave me antibiotics and I felt better within 12 hours but I had to take those antibiotics for 10 days. That's hard to even remember to do when you're feeling great. Um, you still need to take those antibiotics to make sure that we've killed every last bacteria that we can and that the fewest number of um, resistant bacteria are surviving. Okay, um, now let's go ahead and talk about viruses. So that's what you need to know about bacteria. Let's talk about viruses. There's a little bit less information about viruses simply because viruses aren't alive. We're not gonna talk as much about them. So viruses have some things in common with life. Um, they're kind of on this line in between life and non-life. They're made of DNA, that sounds alive, and they have proteins. They, they're coated in a protein, it's called a capsid. Let me get my picture out of the way there. The protein coat is called a capsid. And I will point out that what you're looking at are viruses and they're pretty freaky looking. They have very odd geometric shapes. These things here, these are viruses that are sitting on a bacteria. Look at, they look like little robots or aliens or something. Um, those are the protein capsids on the outside and then inside is their DNA. They are not Importantly, they are not made of cells, so we don't consider them to be living, although they're right on that edge between what's living and non-living. So how is it that viruses make us sick? Well, it's totally different than bacteria. Remember, bacteria release these poisons that make us sick, these toxins. Viruses actually enter into our cells. They go and they trick our cells. They look like good things, and then they come in and they... Um, release their DNA and the DNA says make more viruses. So then the cell, it's tricked and it starts making these viruses because there's DNA that says make viruses. So the cell does whatever DNA tells it to do. So it starts making lots of viruses and eventually the cell bursts because it's completely packed full of these viruses. So that's what you're seeing a picture of here. This down at the bottom, this is a cell. And then all these little dots, all these little polka dots, those are viruses that burst out of the cell because the cell made so many of them. So when viruses burst out of our cells, the cells are killed and we start to feel pain like a sore throat. Think about how colds usually start with a sore throat. That's because your cells are like, pew, 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 they're all exploding um, and you get this crappy feeling and you start to run a fever and whatever. That's because they're blowing up your cells. All right. So how do we treat and prevent um, viruses. Well, up until recently, um, we've had antibiotics since like the 1930s. Don't quote me on that. Um, we've had antibiotics, but we have had nothing to treat, um, to cure a virus. Um, about, I don't know, 20 years ago, they invented Tamiflu and it does not work very well, but it helps. Um, and it's to help prevent um, the flu. Some people get sick with the flu. These are called antiviral drugs. Um, so remember, antibiotic is for the bacteria. Antiviral drugs are for the viruses. Um, so Tamiflu is one that helps us fight the flu. Um, we'll learn a little bit more about the flu later, but just sometimes we need help fighting the flu. And then Paxlovid is a new one that fights COVID. Um, and it, again, they're not perfect drugs. It's not that you won't be sick at all, um, but they usually prevent hospitalization. So death and that kind of thing um, is prevented with those. All right. But typically, instead of using those antivirals, because they're new and we haven't, um, we haven't, they haven't been around for very long. Um, typically, we use vaccines to prevent viral diseases. So what's in a vaccine? A vaccine has um, it depends. So there's different types of vaccines and, and we've got some new vaccines that are out now too, and I'll explain that. So typically um, vaccines contain a part of a virus. So this is, here's the virus right here. That's that green thing. Um, it might be just this little spike. That might be the all that's in the vaccine, like a bunch of those little spikes. Um, or it might be the entire virus, but the scientists have damaged the virus so that it looks like the virus, but it can't make you sick. It doesn't function. 
or more recently, we've made mRNA vaccines, which contain the instructions for building the virus, building a weak version of the virus. So your body builds this virus on its own, but it's a weak form. And then your body recognizes the the virus and then it attacks it and, and learns how to cure it. So it says the body learns to fight it off when it's in the weakened state so that if it encounters the real variety of the virus, the body is prepared to fight it off. So oftentimes when we get a vaccine, we feel cruddy the next day or two. And that was really true with the COVID vaccine. The reason we feel cruddy isn't because we're sick with COVID. It's because our immune system is ramping up and our white blood cells are attacking and we might get a fever and we might get body aches, (coughs) might feel crappy. That's our immune system working. That's not COVID. That's our immune system learning how to fight off that disease. Okay, so then there are some viruses that mutate really often. So these spikes, they might change shape. And so for those, we have to get booster shots. We have to, and flu is a classic example, and now COVID unfortunately has been an example. They change a little bit, and so the immune system starts to go, I don't recognize this virus anymore. And so it gets harder and harder for your immune system to fight it, the more mutation. So that's why we need our boosters. Um, And there are even some viruses that mutate so often that vaccines are difficult to formulate. So the common cold, which is caused by rhinovirus, we haven't even made a vaccine for that one yet because it's mutating about every six weeks, depends. Um, And so we just, we can't make boosters that have people take boosters that often. Um, HIV is another example of a virus that changes so frequently. Um, We've made some vaccines with some success and some limited success, um, but we're still working on that um, as well because they change so often. I will mention though that chickenpox is an example of a virus that does not mutate very often. So usually people can get their one chickenpox vaccine and then they're good to go for most of their lives. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. Let me know if you have any questions.